Dr. Deborah Fennell, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the International Nurses Society and Addictions webinar series that focuses on the use of opioid therapies for treatment of opioid dependence and on the safe use of opioids and treatment of chronic pain. This series is one of many resources made available by the Prescriber's Clinical Support System Opioid Therapies, a program that is funded by the Federal Center for Substance Abuse Treatment and operated collaboratively by six other partner organizations, the American Academy of Medi Addiction Psychiatry, the American Psychiatric Association, the American Medical Association, American Osteopathic Academy of Addiction Medicine, American Dental Association, and the American Society for Pain Management Nursing. <clears throat> I'd like to just go through a few quick housekeeping notes before we get to today's presentation. In the upper right of your computer screen, you'll see a control panel. In the lower portion of that panel, participants can type in a question or comment and submit it to the webinar organizers. You can do this at any time during the presentation. We will reserve about 10 minutes at the end of the presentation for questions and answers. And if we're unable to get to all your questions in the allotted time, Dr. King has agreed to respond to them in writing. The webinar, presentation slides, and questions and answers will be posted on the PCSSO website in the near future, as well as uh, the INSA website at www.intnsa.org. Today, Dr. Paul King will address healthcare and prescription opioid use in veterans with pers persistent post-concussion symptoms, PTSD, and chronic pain. He will provide a background on co-occurrence of post-concussion symptoms, PTSD, and chronic pain in veterans, review recent literature on healthcare utilization, pain management, and prescription opioid use in this population, and discuss clinical implications for pain management strategies in veterans with these conditions. Dr. King is a postdoc psychology fellow in the VA Advanced Fellowship Program in the Mental Illness Research and Treatment, MIRIC at the VA Vision 2 Center for Integrated Healthcare, where he researches the needs of veterans with history of head injury and or cognitive impairment, primarily in VA primary care settings. He has collaborated with other VA researchers in a large multi-site study to assess cognition in veterans after traumatic brain injury, as well as local focus group study to investigate facilitators and barriers to veterans using integrated behavioral health services. More recently, he's begun to analyze administrative data to explore healthcare utilization practices in veterans with traumatic brain injury and persistent post-concussion symptoms. His applied work takes place in both integrated primary care and the geriatric evaluation and management clinics. He is a licensed psychologist in New York State. His broad interest lies in post-deployment health issues in combat veterans. Those specific domains include cognitive and emotional impacts of deployment, assessment, and management of post-concussion symptoms, and the co-occurrence of traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress disorder. The ultimate goal of his research portfolio is to increase awareness of issues related to the experience of head injury in the veteran population and to enhance delivery of care to these veterans. Prior to his current position, he completed his PhD in counseling psychology at the State University of New York at Buffalo, a pre-doctoral internship at the Buffalo VA Medical Center, and worked in several neuropsychological clinics and counseling centers across western New York, performing psychological assessments in inpatient, outpatient, residential, and university settings. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. King. Well, thank you. Let me just start off by saying thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, today, I'll be talking about health care and prescription opioid use in veterans with persistent post-concussion symptoms, post-traumatic stress disorder, and chronic pain, topics that in part populate my primary area of interest, which is post-deployment health for our OEF, OIF veterans, and also things that I've seen come up in the course of my clinical work over the past several years. Before I get started, let me acknowledge that funding for this webinar series was made possible by SAMHSA, and the views expressed in the series do not reflect the official policies or positions of DHHS or the U.S. government. There are also a few acknowledgments that I have to make. 
First of all, my time and efforts in preparing this talk were supported by the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, Office of Academic Affiliations, Advanced Fellowship Program in Mental Illness, Research and Treatment, and the VA Vision 2 Center for Integrated Healthcare, where I'm at the tail end of a two-year clinical and research fellowship. Of course, the views expressed in this talk are based on my own review of the literature and, again, do not reflect the position or policy of the U.S. government or U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs and I have no conflicts of interest to declare. My talk today will center on three main objectives. First, I'll provide some background on the co-occurrence of persistent post-concussion symptoms, PTSD, and chronic pain in veterans. Then I'll review some recent literature on healthcare utilization, pain management, and prescription opioid use in veterans with history of traumatic brain injury and persistent post-concussion symptoms, PTSD, and chronic pain. And finally, I will very broadly discuss some clinical considerations for pain management strategies in veterans with these co-occurring conditions. Let's start with some background. There are a number of mental and behavioral health conditions that are common among veterans of operations enduring and Iraqi freedom, or OEF, OIF. Today, I'll be talking primarily about three of them traumatic brain injury, or TBI, and the associated post-concussion symptoms uh, with that condition, post-traumatic stress disorder, and chronic pain. I won't dedicate too much detail to depression and alcohol and or substance misuse separately, but know that these are notable clinical concerns in this population as well. Estimates of the prevalence of TBI in OEF, OIF veterans vary considerably, with reports ranging from as low as 7% to as high as 23%. Typically, lower estimates tend to correspond to rates of clinician-confirmed diagnoses, with higher estimates corresponding to self-reported history of head injury. The approximately 7% figure uh, was reported in a paper by Taylor and colleagues, and this figure referred specifically to OEF, OIF veterans with clinician-confirmed TBI who were active VA healthcare users, and thus this did not necessarily account for those veterans who were not using VA services post-discharge. Of course, the rates of PTSD and chronic pain reported also vary, but they're also respectively quite high, approaching at times near half of OEF, OIF veterans sampled. Although today I'll be referring primarily to rates observed within OEF, OIF veterans, it is worth mentioning that there is a wide body of literature that's explored the rates of these conditions in other veteran cohorts, as well as the veteran population at large. Okay, so now I'll provide just a little detail on what it means when we're talking about TBI. Of course, a TBI or a traumatic brain injury can result from the application of force to the head. This can be from an object striking the head, the head striking an object, or from the forces associated with acceleration or deceleration injuries, such as in the case of whiplash. Now, these scenarios do not always result in a TBI. The real distinguishing feature of a positive TBI diagnosis has to do with the presence of at least one symptom, such as altered mental status, loss of consciousness, amnesia, or other focal neurological deficits, or an actual brain lesion at the time of the injury. And that last piece, the temporal link, is really important. These symptoms have to be present immediately after the time of injury in order to qualify for TBI diagnosis. Also, I should mention uh, that the terms mild traumatic brain injury, or MTBI, and concussion mean the same thing, and I will use these terms interchangeably throughout the talk. It's well accepted that the majority of TBIs are mild in nature. Somewhere in the range of 75 to 90 percent of all injuries are, are considered to be mild. Although it's important to note that the definition of a mild TBI can vary somewhat based on which criteria you're referring to. So today when I refer to mild TBI, Really what I'm referring to is the ACRM, or the American Congress of Rehabilitation Medicine's definition of mild TBI, which is that symptoms such as loss of consciousness do not exceed 30 minutes, symptoms of post-traumatic amnesia do not exceed one day, and that Glasgow Coma Scale scores range from 13 to 15 after about 30 minutes. And for those of you not familiar with the Glasgow Coma Scale, scores that approach 15 are better, as uh, they correspond to a fully alert and awake person. As an aside, I won't be discussing moderate to severe injuries in any real detail today, 
but there is a literature available on these injuries and, of course, the associated rehabilitative processes. I will also point out that for any curious parties, there are a number of useful and well-written pieces available on the pathophysiology of TBI and how, and how it is that the various mechanisms of injury can disrupt brain processes, and references for some of these are available in the reference list. Uh, but back to business. It's also well accepted that military personnel are at an especially high risk of sustaining TBIs due to the nature of modern combat operations. Many of the mild injuries reported in the literature are attributable to the effects of blast exposure via improvised explosive devices, with more severe injuries being associated with penetrative injuries, as in the case of gunshot wounds. This was demonstrated in a 2011 study by McGregor and colleagues showed that 89% of all TBIs sustained in a sample of 2,074 troops were mild, and of those, 95% were actually due to the effects of blast. Several of the references oops, listed down here at the bottom uh, provide an excellent overview of the effects of blast exposure on the brain, and in particular, I would point out uh, the De Palma and colleagues review, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2005 and the Tabor and colleagues review from 2006. Management of TBI is clearly a priority within the Veterans Health Administration. But having a history of head injury and then presumably healing is certainly not the same thing as having a current head injury and current symptoms. We'll talk more about this later, but this has important implications for screening practices. For example, the current four-item VA traumatic brain injury screening tool is not designed to identify veterans who ever had a head injury, head injury. It's designed to identify OEF, OIF veterans who sustained a possible head injury and who are currently symptomatic. Also note that positive screens do not necessarily mean that there is or was a TBI for certain. Clinician confirmation is needed to establish that, and that's done via a full diagnostic assessment. Positive screens simply indicate that the veteran is reporting symptoms that could be due to a head injury but also could be due to other medical or psychiatric conditions. Current clinical practice guidelines suggest several helpful algorithms uh, for the assessment and treatment planning of veterans with mild traumatic brain injury. So again, what we're referring to when we discuss a TBI is that an individual sustained a jolt to the head and then experienced symptoms immediately thereafter. Now we already discussed that the diagnostic features of a TBI and they include loss of consciousness or altered, altered mental status and so forth. But in fact, there are actually a number of associated symptoms that are commonly reported immediately after a head injury. And we would expect that to be the case after disruption of brain functioning. Recent results from factor analytic studies suggest that these symptoms fall into three main groups, cognitive symptoms, affective symptoms, and somatosensory symptoms. And here we see several examples of the various symptoms or complaints that might fall into these categories. For example, symptoms such as headache, which is the most common complaint post-TBI, sleep disturbance, irritability, and forgetfulness, just to name a few. Now, in contrast to this categorical approach uh, that's outlined here, some researchers argue that persistent post-concussion symptoms do not constitute a unitary construct and should instead be considered a constellation of unique complaints that may occur post-TBI in any given patient. But the real take home from this is that there are actually a number of common symptoms that we could expect to see immediately post-injury. As I mentioned, most TBIs are mild in nature, and most individuals who sustain a mild TBI can and do recover fully, and clinically, they're actually expected to do so. Furthermore, although many individuals who do sustain a mild TBI will experience some constellation of the various affective, cognitive, and somatosensory symptoms I mentioned earlier, these symptoms typically resolve within a matter of a few weeks. Uh, studies on athletes who sustain mild TBI tend to show a full recovery within about five to 10 days. And even studies on accident victims and trauma patients tend to evidence full recovery within about one to three months. It's really only a small, very small percentage of patients, perhaps around 5%, uh, as is evidenced by large, well-controlled studies, but maybe as high as 
who then go on to complain of what we refer to as persistent post-concussion symptoms, or as I'll abbreviate here, PPCS. It's more often the case that patients who would go on to sustain uh, moderate to severe injuries would then be at risk of lasting cognitive deficits. There's a wide body of literature that suggests an association between TBI diagnosis and a host of mental health concerns. Now, this association is not necessarily causal in nature, and we can't make that inference. However, as we can see, the association is very strong at times. Depression is among uh, the leading comorbidities identified in civilian samples, with much attention being given recently to the co-occurrence of PTSD in veterans with a history of TBI. A variety of published accounts, including work by Peter Zak and colleagues and Bryant and colleagues, suggest that the presence of PTSD itself mediates the relationship between TBI and a host of outcomes, such as pain severity, physical health, depression, life satisfaction, and even community engagement post-injury. As we see here, there have been fairly consistent findings that document high rates, uh, again approaching about 90%, of finding at least one mental health diagnosis in veterans with TBI history, with approximately 64% of these veterans meeting criteria for two or more mental health diagnoses. In fact, Lisa Brenner's research even suggests that individuals with uh, TBI history are at increased risk for suicide, which also relates to the presence of notable men mental health concerns in this population. Now, also worth mention is that Reports of chronic pain are very common among persons with a history of TBI. And in terms of estimates, these figures rival that of rates of co-occurring PTSD in TBI cohorts. And we can see uh, the, the, the range of estimates here. This next slide illustrates some notable features specific to OEF, OIF veterans with clinician-confirmed TBI diagnosis who use VA healthcare. These figures were extracted from a review of national VA records conducted by Taylor and colleagues. And what we see is that from 2009 to 2011, the number of OEF, OIF veterans with documented TBI has steadily risen. Most often, these are male veterans with service-connected conditions who meet criteria for at least one mental health condition. And typically, as we see, that condition is PTSD. Also noteworthy, though, are the high rates of pain reports, typically headache, and in more than half the cases, some combination of PTSD and reports of chronic pain. And these are the things that I'll talk about next and how they fit together in this special population. On this next slide is just a refresher of PTSD symptom clusters as we saw them in DSM-4 re-experiencing, avoidance, and hyperarousal symptoms. The way these symptoms are laid out uh, for now fit just fine for our purposes is the research that I'll be referencing primarily use these criteria for diagnostic impressions, although I will point out that PTSD criteria have been revised a bit for DSM-5. Clearly a number of notable behavioral and affective features exist, such as sleep disturbance and irritability, and these are among many of the symptoms that are of interest for us today. Of course, a joint VA Department of Defense clinical practice guideline exists for the assessment and management of PTSD symptoms as well. Uh, following PTSD, we have a very brief overview or refresher on chronic pain. Uh, according to Mirsky and, and Bogduck, chronic pain is typically identified when pain complaints last longer than 90 days. There are several common pain complaints, but among the most common are headache, back and neck pain, and neuropathic pain. Certainly issues of headache and back and neck pain are relevant to us in our discussion, as these are also commonly reported in persons with history of head injury. And of course, especially germane to our discussion in the OEF-OIF population in general is the issue of polytrauma defined in the VHA handbook is two or more concurrent injuries to physical regions or organ systems, where one of which may be life-threatening, resulting in physical, cognitive, psychological, or psychosocial impairments and functional disabilities. 
Likewise, a number of notable behavior, behavioral and affective features exist within the scope of the pain experience to include sleep difficulty, fatigue, as well as irritability. Depression and other mental health concerns are certainly not uncommon in pain populations. Uh, also, as this is the case with both MTBI and PTSD. And again, VA directives and a joint VA DOD clinical practice guideline also exist on managing pain and opioid therapies. So how do these things all fit together? Well, as we saw before, each is common among veterans and both PTSD and complaints of chronic pain frequently occur among veterans with history of TBI who complain of persistent post-concussive symptoms. Taking note of this, Lou and colleagues referred to these three co-occurring conditions as the polytrauma clinical triad, or as I'll abbreviate later in this presentation, P3. And not only do these conditions co-occur at notably high rates, an added challenge is that many symptoms associated with each condition separately are in essence the same, which makes it difficult, if not impossible, to definitively comment on the underlying etiology. For example, whether a symptom is attributable to lasting effects of concussion, PTSD, or chronic pain, or some combination of the above. Take, for example, Stein and McAllister's comments on the breakdown of PTSD and persistent post-concussive symptoms. It's easy to see that there's actually a significant shared symptomatology here. And that kind of brings us to the next component of, of this discussion. We know from the literature that it's typically only a small subset of patients that develop persistent post-concussive symptoms. And in part because of this, uh, because of the notion of shared symptomatology, uh, the idea of PPCS is controversial to begin with. Given the very nature of the cognitive, affective, and, somatosensory, and somatosensory symptom constellations, it's very possible that post-concussion-like symptoms could then be explained by a variety of potential causes, ranging from the TBI itself to just plain old normal variation. And uh, to illustrate this, we can use cognitive symptoms as a perfect example. So for example, some research does show a small but notable effect of mild TBI on cognition. In 2010, Bellinger and colleagues demonstrated a small association between mild TBI and lowered performance on measures of delayed memory and executive functioning. And so there is, so, there is some evidence that MTBI can have some lasting effects. Although in contrast, a far more robust literature demonstrates a stronger effect and more severe injuries. So in Draper and Ponsford, Ponsford's research, for example, patients with moderate to severe injuries evidence overall worse performance on neuropsychological measures even after 10, 10 years post-injury. But the literature has also at times demonstrated evidence of attentional and other neuropsychological deficits in persons with PTSD. A study by Marx and colleagues showed reduced attentional performance on neuropsychological tasks in patients with PTSD. And then Campbell and colleagues also showed that persons with PTSD and co-occurring PTSD and TBI yielded lower, lower overall executive functioning uh, performance than those persons with TBI alone. In their sample, the individuals with both PTSD and TBI performed worse than those with a single PTSD or TBI diagnosis. But now in contrast, research by Gordon and colleagues did not demonstrate any effect of PTSD on neuropsychological performance. So uh, the evidence on these cognitive kind of complications are, is mixed at best. And furthermore, numerous medications commonly used to manage psychiatric and pain concerns, such as benzodiazepines and opiates, are known to have adverse effects on cognition. Among burn patients with TBI prescribed analgesic medications, Cooper and colleagues published a small but noticeable effect on cognitive performance, such that the presence of analgesic medications accounted for about 13% of variance in cognitive test scores. In a very well-written 2005 review, and I would certainly urge any of you to read this paper if you're interested in issues pertaining to TBI, Iverson published effect sizes of various influences on cognition. In general, the effect size of MTBI on cognition ranged from about 0.3 to about 0.4 within 30 days of injury 
but after that period then dropped to only 0.1, so a much, a much smaller effect. Now in comparison, effect sizes for benzodiazepine use, depression, litigation, and other mental health concerns range from about 0.4 to 0.7. And that's a much stronger effect than MTBI evidenced after the 30-day period. Now of note, one other thing that I will mention in the Iverson paper, uh, the effect size for malingering or symptom exaggeration exceeded 1.0, so there was a much stronger effect noted there. And certainly, uh, some neuropsychological studies have looked at what would be considered normal, healthy persons. And even these studies demonstrate that poor performance on subcognitive tasks is actually a frequent occurrence. I've highlighted a quote from, uh, from Binder and colleagues' 2009 paper, which showed this uh, effect. And in essence, they found that abnormal performance on some proportion of neuropsychological tests in a battery is, in fact, psychometrically normal. So considering that, it's easy to see that, uh, to see what we might view as persistent post-concussive symptoms are not specific and can potentially be associated with several other explanations. According to a quote from Iverson in 2005, a person who has depression, chronic pain, post-traumatic stress disorder, or a combination of problems is virtually guaranteed to endorse many post-concussion-like symptoms. In several studies of normal controls, persons with depression, PTSD, uh, even certain personality characteristics, and persons involved in litigation indeed have demonstrated increased rates of post-concussive-like symptom reports even among people who never sustained a TBI. And so that, that being said, though, these symptoms are still also associated with TBI. And some recent studies have shown that veterans exposed to BLAST are particularly susceptible to these reports. For example, in LIPA and colleagues' study, uh, patients with BLAST injuries reported higher degrees of symptoms than those without BLAST injuries although they did also find that PTSD accounted for much of the variance in symptom reporting. Krauss et al. also studied a sample of 235 MTBI patients for six months and found higher rates of symptom reports even after adjusting for baseline and pre-injury characteristics. And yet other research has identified a number of other factors pertaining to PPCS reporting, among which include uh, diagnosis threat, or the idea that calling attention to an injury may impact the way that symptoms are recounted or understood, or the expectation is etiology hypothesis. Uh, basically, once you have an injury, you might look for uh, certain symptoms to manifest. Symptom mis misattribution, uh, so mistaking symptoms of one condition for another. So for example, a PTSD symptom for uh, a, a post-concussion symptom recall bias, uh, attributing symptoms to a, a, a prior event, and also motivation for secondary gain. But to be clear, this does not mean that symptoms are not real, and it does mean, though, that there may be a variety of factors that influence them. And both Mears and colleagues and Ponsford and colleagues offer a potential explanation for this which is that the earliest post-concussion symptoms may be attributable to physiological changes in the brain, which take place right after an injury, but then that perceived persistence of these symptoms is strongly or may be strongly influenced by psychiatric and other non-injury non related factors. And this actually lines up with what we've seen in some of our own previous research. In a 2012 study, King and colleagues explored rates of common post-concussion symptom reports among a sample of 500 OEF, OIF veterans with and without history of TBI. For reference, the veterans in this study who had sustained a TBI on average were injured about three and a half years prior to data collection, so there was actually quite a bit of time that had elapsed. And what you see graphed here are the means represented by circles and confidence intervals represented by line stems of a post-concussion symptom inventory commonly used in the VA. Now, if you notice, veterans with history of TBI, this group down here, actually reported very few overall symptoms uh, at, this, at this mark. 
In fact, the only group that reported fewer symptoms was the subset of veterans who reported neither TBI history nor any psychiatric disturbance, although, as you can see, they did, they did still report uh, a handful of symptoms. But as you progress throughout the hierarchy, you see that multiple diagnoses, both inclusive and exclusive of TBI, yielded higher and higher overall symptom reports culminating with the group of veterans who met criteria for confirmed TBI history, as well as TBI, general anxiety, and depression. So we see that, uh, again, there's a very strong effect noted of these kind of co-occurring psychiatric conditions. But that about does it for the overview of persistent post-concussion symptoms, PTSD, and chronic pain. And veterans. Now I'll switch gears a little bit and talk about some other recent studies which document healthcare utilization, pain management, and prescription opioid use in these veterans. We'll start with the healthcare side of things. Uh, several papers within the past decade or so have identified a number of conditions that we've already discussed uh, as being linked to increased use of healthcare services. So for example, combat exposure itself. Separate from, separate from any psychiatric illness, has been identified as one predictor of increased healthcare service use. PTSD has not only been shown to directly influence mental health service utilization, but also to be an indirect influence on medical care utilization via inflating the risk of medical disease burden. And these are findings from my colleague Kyle Passamato at the Syracuse and the Syracuse VA. And of course, both depression and chronic pain have been linked to increases in medical and mental health care utilization. And now even some recent studies have linked TBI to increases in health care utilization as well. Before continuing, I will say that there is at least one other study on health care utilization in veterans with TBI that I'm aware of, other than the, the handful of studies that I'll explicitly be discussing, although I'm not going to review that study in detail as it documented service utilization in a heterogeneous cohort of 72 veterans who are as many as 40 years post-injury. I have, however, provided a reference uh, for this study in the reference list should anybody be interested in perusing that paper. And so these data are taken from the same series of studies I mentioned earlier by Taylor and colleagues. Records included all OEF, OIF veterans using Veterans Health Administration services during VA fiscal years 2009 through 2011. Although cross-sectional and very much descriptive in nature, we can see that veterans with clinician-confirmed TBI averaged nearly four visits to their primary care physicians per year and nearly 12 visits to mental health providers per year at a cost of nearly four times more than the average OEF, OIF patient. So this smaller subset of individuals is really accounting for a substantial increase in cost. In a smaller but separate study, King and colleagues explored outpatient healthcare utilization in a sample of 780 veterans with TBI receiving care in upstate New York. Overall, these veterans were demographically very similar to those as reported in the Taylor et al. studies and evidenced similar rates of primary care usage. Now, in our study, we did observe somewhat lower rates of mental health services, uh, but that may be in part because we focused exclusively on outpatient services whereas Taylor et al. included inpatient utilization in their investigation. But in the course of our study, we became concerned that there might be some observable effects relative to uh, things like participant age, PTSD status, time involved in treatment, and injury severity. So we then focused only on veterans with history of closed head injury who were in their very first year of VA care and then used a statistical matching algorithm to age match case controls. We also used treatment index dates for extracting control data so that we observed controls over a similar one-year period of time, and then employed uh, PTSD diagnosis as a covariate in our analyses. And on this next slide, focusing just on the distinction between OEF, OIF with TBI, uh, that's the red bars, versus those who did not have TBI, the blue bars, we indeed see again that veterans with TBI used substantially more overall physical and mental health services when compared to controls. However, 
when we broke the groups down by both TBI and PTSD diagnoses, we saw an interesting additive effect of PTSD above and beyond the effect of TBI status alone. So consistent with our hypothesis, medical service use followed a generally linear trend uh, such that veterans with neither TBI nor PTSD use the overall lowest rates of services, and then typically followed next by veterans with PTSD only. The exception, of course, was with regard to mental health services. Uh, as veterans with PTSD used substantially more mental health visits than controls, and again, that was to be expected. However, what we also saw was this unique additive effect such that veterans with TBI and PTSD use the highest overall services, as well as about one and a half times the number of mental health visits than veterans with PTSD alone. And so it was that combined TBI and PTSD status that really seemed to account for uh, quite a bit more in terms of face-to-face -face encounters. In a subsequent study, we explored healthcare utilization in a separate group of 421 veterans with history of TBI who then also reported persistent post-concussion symptoms. Again, this group was demographically very similar to the population of OEF, OIF veterans with TBI in our previous study, and also uh, those veterans with TBI who used VA care over the past several years in the Taylor study. And they were also treated for back, neck, and head pain at grossly similar rates. One thing that I will point out, though, is that we also coded for arthritic pain in addition to the typical back, neck, and head pain, and we actually found very high rates among both veterans with PPCS and case controls as well, and that's notable considering that uh, many of these veterans are, are actually very young. As with our previous study, we used a statistical matching program to age match participants uh, to identify index dates for treatment and then to code PTSD as well. And we followed these records for approximately two years. And again, in line with our hypothesis, we observed high rates of healthcare utilization in the persistent post-concussion symptom group in comparison to case controls. But the next piece that we wanted to look at was the relative effect of PTSD and pain on healthcare utilization in this sample. But as it turned out, so many of the veterans with persistent post-concussion symptoms had PTSD that we actually weren't able to make meaningful statistical comparisons between the PTSD positive and negative subgroup of veterans. Uh, the sample size differences just wouldn't allow for it. However, we were then able to explore the relative influence of pain on healthcare, uh, healthcare services among veterans with PPCS and PTSD. And surprisingly, there actually were very few differences. In fact, after accounting for the influence of PTSD, there was not much additional medical or mental health service burden uh, by considering the effect of chronic pain. So in other words, veterans with PPCS and PTSD were using similar, or I'm sorry, were using services at similar rates as veterans with P3, or with all three of those conditions together. And this is very early evidence to suggest that it might be this combination of uh, perceived persistent post-concussion symptoms and PTSD that accounts for the bulk of face-to-face -face, uh, healthcare encounters in this subsample. The next topic under healthcare utilization involves opioid use specifically. So I'll start with just a, a very brief overview of opioid use in veterans. Uh, a couple of studies, studies by Clark and studies by Macy, suggest that about 44 to 64 percent of veterans with chronic pain receive opioid analgesics. Although pain interference has been associated with some increased risk of opioid misuse, substantially larger risks for misuse and for non-medical use are associated with alcohol, drug, and opioid misuse disorders, as well as depression. Some studies, uh, for example, Becker et al., have even shown a link with smoking. Uh, now, research has shown benefits to scheduling and monitoring opioid use to include increased compliance and better pain treatment outcomes uh, for opioid users. In veteran subsets, particularly among veterans with PTSD and other mental health concerns, uh, researchers such as Hawkins et al. have observed high rates of concurrent benzodiazepine and opioid use. Some studies have even shown that OEF-OIF veterans with chronic pain are highly likely to be prescribed opioids, 
typically by their primary care providers, and that even short-acting opioids were common among long-term opioid users. And also veterans with PTSD and other psychopathology, uh, they've, they've been shown as well to be more likely to receive high doses of opioids to get early refills and even to be prescribed multiple uh, concurrent opioids at the same time. Next, I'll talk a little bit about opioid use in patients with TBI history in general. Uh, some civilian studies have shown that as many as 71% of patients who were hospitalized for TBI uh, after motor vehicle accidents, for example, uh, receive an opioid prescription at the time of discharge. Now, typically, these prescriptions are intended to be short-lived and you know, for use in managing issues with acute pain. But outside of this case, relatively little information is available on the use of op opioids in other persons with TBI. One recent study of former NFL players by Kotler et al. suggested that more than 70% of participants in their sample misused opioids at some point during their career, with only 5% reporting that they had used their medications as prescribed. Now, in their study, undiagnosed concussions significantly predicted current opioid misuse with an adjusted odds ratio of more than four. But despite the research that's available on veterans in general, civilians, and pro athletes, substantially less is known about opioid use in veterans with TBI. Because of this dearth of knowledge, and this is admittedly the least developed portion of the talk, uh, this is an area clearly in need of additional research. Much of what is known on veterans with TBI using opioids comes from data published from VA polytrauma rehabilitation centers and network sites. Two of the very few works that have attempted to document opioid use among veterans with TBI and or polytrauma are Clark and colleagues and French and colleagues, respectively. In their paper, Clark et al. pointed out that although pain-related problems were common among wounded veterans, that there's a limited understanding with regard to pain outcomes in this population. In fact, with regard to pain assessment, management, and treatment, Clark et al. noted that empirical data, while provocative, are actually limited. As an early effort, they documented rates of pharmacotherapies in a sample of 15 veterans seen at a large VA polytrauma rehabilitation center. Approximately 58% of these veterans had been treated with opioids though the authors identified an ultimate goal of reducing reliance on opioids for pain management while simultaneously reducing potential cognitive side effects and pain intensity. In a later study, French and colleagues explored medication use in a sample of 60 veterans with combat polytrauma, including blast injury, and also observed notably higher rates of opioid and anticonvulsant use, as well as multiple other medications with potential side effects. In fact, participants in their sample averaged about 17 pharmacy claims per month. So again, in, in the French et al. study, their sample averaged 17 pharmacy claims in a month. One additional component of our previously mentioned study on veterans with PPCS uh, was to explore rates of medication use. Our findings, although very much descriptive in nature, also suggests that more than half of the 400 veterans we collected pharmacy data on were prescribed opioids, and that these veterans also used a number of other medications at notably high rates. And these findings build upon the data published by Clark and colleagues and French and colleagues. But again, being that these data are very much descriptive in nature, uh, it's difficult to draw conclusions about clinical outcomes or the pathways in which these veterans specifically came to be prescribed their medications or for what uh, specific concerns. But again, generally, little is known about opioid use in veterans with TBI, as well as uh, their pain treatment outcomes. And this is an area uh, in, in dire need of future study. In one mixed method study, we're currently exploring in depth the experiences uh, that veterans with TBI have had with symptoms and their symptom management practices in a sample of about 30 veterans with, uh, with history of TBI and including pain management strategies and their response to intervention. For this, we're conducting a series of qualitative interviews, as well as administering a series of self-reports in hopes of gaining a better understanding of treatment satisfaction as well as their, their pain outcomes. But again, the research in this area is very limited currently. <laughs> 
So on to the last section, um, clinical implications. So what does this all mean for clinicians in everyday practice? Well, actually, there are several take-home points. Uh, the first step pertaining to appreciating the complex literature on the topics that we've covered today. It's important to understand the demographics and common presenting concerns of the veterans that we might work with, and to know that PTSD and pain often co-occur in veterans with a history of mild TBI. Second, it's important for clinicians to remember that perceived cognitive deficits are not necessarily attributable to TBI history, and that other explanations may exist to include normal variation. Now, that doesn't mean that cognitive deficits aren't present. It's just adding a bit of context uh, to some of those complaints. And third, it's important to screen for and assess current symptoms related to TBI, PTSD, and chronic pain, as well as alcohol and substance use and sleep problems. But remember that positive screens are not the same as a confirmed diagnosis. Case in point, veterans with PTSD are, in fact, very likely to report a host of common post-concussion-like symptoms, as we've discussed. And research has shown that the presence of PTSD actually significantly impacts the false positive rate of the VA's uh, four-item TBI screening tool. The second set of implications really pertain to practice. Patients may present with a wide variety of valid concerns, and it's up to us as providers to provide education and feedback around their recovery expectancy. We should engage patients in active treatment planning, uh, negotiate appropriate referrals, and also discuss with them the reasons why we might recommend a referral or, or a further assessment. Of course, clinical practice guidelines do exist for mild TBI, for PTSD, and for pain management. And current VA consensus recommendations suggest that they should be followed. Uh, likely helpful practices, uh, particularly for this population, it may include reviewing medications and dosage, particularly those, particularly those medications with known cognitive side effects, as they may play into reports of persistent post-concussion symptoms, optimizing and reducing medications when possible, and certainly considering consultations with uh, polytrauma, mental health, and clinical pharmacy specialists. We should also appreciate the complexity of the biopsychosocial factors involved in the lives of the veterans who are presenting to us with these comorbid conditions. And finally, as much as possible, we should practice interdisciplinary care for these veterans, maintain an open dialogue among primary care, specialty care, and other affiliated providers. So to summarize our talk, TBI is a prevalent, complex, and costly condition in OEF, OIF veterans. Veterans with history of TBI and PPCS are likely to use primary care and mental health resources, as well as other VA services at higher rates than other veterans. Veterans who report long-lasting post-concussion symptoms are also frequently diagnosed with PTSD and report chronic pain concerns. Of note, the relationship between TBI or persistent post-concussion symptoms and many common comorbid conditions can be reciprocal in nature in terms of symptom exacerbation and risk. I'm going to step in here because uh, it sounds like uh, maybe our presenter uh, is dropped off. Um, and while we're hopefully waiting for him to come back in, um, I um, <clears throat> have some comments that have come in. And I would like um, to have people at this time weigh in with some questions so that um, we can field those to Dr. King when he returns. Um, and again, he's uh, indicated that he would address questions uh, in writing as well. Um, so we just ask people to weigh in with some questions. <clears throat> 
Uh, he's also indicated to us that he would provide the uh, references, a full reference list, and um, uh, as we've mentioned before, the PowerPoint slides and the handouts will be available and posted on the website. So, um, first of all, I want to thank Dr. King for an excellent and informative presentation. Um, I had uh, some questions that came in that I wanted to ask as well, and one of those related to um, the focus that he had in terms of mild TBI versus moderate. And as he and I had had some discussions earlier on this topic, uh, Dr. King mentioned that the studies on this uh, topic are few uh, and um, perhaps limited. And so that may be why he focused on mild TBI. Um, the um, one study that he mentioned from French et al. Um, would be interesting, I think, for people who are interested to take a look at because that study may be more inclusive of those veterans who uh, would be having, who would have moderate uh, TBI. Uh, another question that came in, um, which we will ask um, Dr. King to um, uh, address, uh, is the limitations for applying findings from civilian populations to the veteran population. Clearly, we know from other literature that the veteran population is uh, very different from civilian populations. So um, I think it's important to, to look at those limitations for applying findings from the other studies. One of the points that he made is that um, the literature looking at TBI as brain-based disorders um, may suggest that there's more similarity between civilian uh, populations and veterans with respect to traumatic brain injury, though the um, the cause of that traumatic brain injury may be significantly different among the veteran population. Um, we have some other questions that have come in, and again, we will ask uh, Dr. King to post um, some response to those. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it looks like we have lost contact with him, and we will certainly maintain contact through having him respond in writing. So let me close by saying that, uh, again, um, with appreciation of Dr. King for really this excellent literature review and informative presentation, I think what, one of the major take po home points here is that the, uh, there is a critical need for research in this area, and though the, uh, in particular, around the polytrauma and opioid use. So uh, for those of you who are clinicians, uh, we hope that the clinical implications have been helpful. And for those of you who are researchers, we hope that Dr. King has given you some great suggestions for future research. I want to thank people for participating in this webinar today. Uh, shortly, you will receive an email from the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry that includes a link to an and evaluation survey, we would ask you to take a few minutes to access it and provide your feedback on today's session. This webinar was recorded and will be posted on the website of the Physicians Clinical Support System Opioid Therapies in the near future. That website is www.pcss- I'm sorry, www.pccs- hyphen o dot org uh, and we'll also have a link for this in the uh, at intnsa.org.
a calendar for upcoming events and helpful clinical resources are posted on that PCSSO type, um, website as well. And all of this information, again, will be posted on our INSA website. We do hope that you'll join us for upcoming PCSSO sessions. And uh, thank you for your um, patience with the webinar today. We had uh, a number of people who stayed through to the um, end, and we really do appreciate that.